right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Appreciate you joining our webinar here, Spring Market Update. Apologies for the technical issues. Not sure what happened, but as we live through this uh, virtual world, we continue to run into these types of issues. But let's go ahead and get started. Thanks again for taking time out of your day to join us. Today, I'd like to give you our, our latest thoughts on the economy and financial markets. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Again, I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management for Wealth and Fiduciary Services here at the bank. Now, let's start with the economy. First, let's talk about the great reopening, the change in monthly payrolls. And jobs market is coming back very strong. The first report uh, released in early April, or one of the first, covered March payrolls and a very strong report, almost a million jobs created. You can see on this chart here how the, the jobs market has bounced back. It struggled a little bit there in late 2020, but you can see the progression as employment is coming back and coming back strong. So we, although we have seen some improvement, the employment is still down just over 8 million from the peak in 2020. We still have some improvement to go, but again, jobs market is starting to ramp up and improve fairly quickly. The ISM surveys, a couple of top tier indicators. These are surveys that go out and ask business owners if conditions are improving or deteriorating. A reading above 50 indicates expansion and a reading below 50 indicates contraction. You can see both the manufacturing and ISM, or both manufacturing and service indices were very strong in March. These were released in early April. For the manufacturing index, that was the strongest release since 1983, and for the service sector, the strongest on record. Very, very robust readings confirm the strength of the jobs report and continue to show just the strength in the overall economy. Elsewhere, you can see activity picking up. If you look at some of the more uh, ordinary measures, some of the mobility data to track how are people resuming their lives, and you can see that uh, diners, this is US open table data, have slowly been coming back and going out to eat. You can see this activity improving uh, as well. And if you were to go through the TSA traveler, measure of people that are getting back on airlines, flying for vacation or business, this also is improving steadily. Both measures have picked up steam in February and March as vaccines ramp up. Uh, it, and the economy begins to reopen. So when you look at the hard data, when you look at mobility data, you're seeing a lot of improvement on the economic front as the economy begins to reopen. I should say, even with the recent news on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's been paused, that shouldn't be much of a hiccup for continued improvement and expansion in the economy. With that, you are starting to see some fairly impressive um, upward revisions to growth for 2021. At the start of the year, the consensus forecast for economic growth was for a 4.2% increase on a year over uh, year over, for the year. Uh, that has increased to 5.6% for the full year. And do not be surprised, this should go over 6% and would not be unheard of to see a 7% growth rate for the full year. You tend to see these forecasts lag a little bit. This current forecast, as you see here on the chart, which is the general consensus, does not include the three data points I just showed you, employment and the two ISM indices. So expect this to continue to be ratcheted higher. And again, would not be surprised to see something certainly in over 6% and would not rule out a 7% growth rate for 2021. That would be one of the strongest years for economic growth. So lots, to, uh, lots of improvement on the economic front. If that's not enough, there is plenty of fuel in terms of stimulus that has helped this economy rebound. And if you compare the amount of stimulus, and this is just fiscal stimulus from the government, it doesn't even take into account what the Fed has done in terms of their support for financial markets, which has also been very, very robust. But the yellow bars show the amount of stimulus and compares it as a percentage of the economy, both uh, now and in 2020, and versus what was done in response to the great financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. And essentially, the amount of stimulus coming from the government is more than double the response from the financial crisis. This does not take into account uh, the infrastructure bill. And a quick note on that, that infrastructure bill that was recently announced at, at uh, the end of March, that won't have much of an economic impact because it is spread out over 10 years. Yes, there'll be a marginal impact, but with the tax increases that are proposed to go along with that, the, there could be a drag in 2022 
on the economy. So that's a potential longer term risk. Uh, but what you're seeing here is just the stimulus enacted in 2020, the eight, 900 billion stimulus that was announced in December, and then the 1.9 trillion coronavirus relief bill that was approved in early March. So a tremendous amount of support that will continue to support the economy, continue to support financial markets as we move forward. So with all of that stimulus and the reopening, it's no surprise that financial assets did well outside of bonds in the first quarter. U.S. small caps led the way with a robust return, and you can see the various categories there for equity markets. Large caps actually lagged their small and mid-cap counterparts, a bit of a reversal uh, from what was seen for much of 2020. These are good returns across the board. They're strong returns, and they reflect that improvement. On the far right, you can see the losers here. High-quality bonds down just over 3%. That's the worst quarterly performance for fixed income markets since 2000, one of the worst on record, pardon me. For the muni market, good resilience there, uh, but again, also a weak return there as investors preferred risk assets and stronger performance. So a good quarter for the equity markets. If you break it down into sector performance, there's a bit of a change in the guards. The more economically sensitive assets, energy, financials, industrials, led performance over the first quarter, and you can see how they outperform the broader market as measured by the S&P 500. And you can see how technology standout in 2020 was a laggard in the first quarter. So a dramatic shift in terms of sector leadership within the equity markets. Uh, that is, if you're a diversified investor, this helps this diversification uh, was generally a plus for the first quarter. First time to really benefit investors that this much in, in a long time active management coming back. So certain passive investment strategies have been positive or certainly popular in recent years and have done well. This is a shift I think that will last uh, to more actively managed strategies. So energy and financials, these are sectors that have been depressed. Despite that strength, I think there's additional room to run for those sectors. And again, it shows the dramatic change from 2020 where technology, Communication services, which includes companies like Netflix and those that benefit from technology, also outperformed. Uh, and you can see the more cyclical sectors lag. So again, sharp reversal in 2000 uh, in, in 21 versus what we saw in 2020. That trend really started in the fourth quarter of, of 2020, and we expect more from those cyclical sectors. They're more attractively valued. Uh, as we move forward. Stay diversified, that is always our mantra. There's always a part of the market that's going to be working, we believe, and it just doesn't pay to try to time different sectors if you have a long-term investment plan. So with all of that positive news on the economy and the performance, what's, what's not to like? And certainly the result of that is that stock market valuations are now expensive. And you can see that most easily in the price to earnings ratio, probably the most common way to see or visualize valuations. The PE ratio on the S&P 500, just over 22. This is based on forward earnings, well above the period average, as you can see here. Uh, that is an expensive valuation. And although it doesn't preclude one from investing in stocks, it does urge caution that returns going forward, and we certainly believe this, are going to be more muted. Think single digit type returns. We do think that these valuations can still uh, they can be sustained or remain above average due to two things. One, relatively low inflation, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and also what are still low bond yields, even though they have come up recently. The key here that's driving this is very, very strong corporate profit growth. Corporate profits are expected to grow 25, 26%, pardon me, in 2021. That is up from an initial forecast of 23%. That is the key driver of stock prices over the long term, and that strong earnings growth should help support these valuations. But again, the market's priced in a lot of good news. We expect a slower pace of performance going forward. If you compare equity valuations to bonds here too, this was a message that we talked about a lot last year. Relative to bonds, even though bond equities were expensive on some absolute measures, when you compare it to bonds, it was still an attractive valuation. That's changed a little bit here in the first quarter as bond yields have come up and the stock market has continued to rise. So valuations relative to bonds are now slightly expensive re uh, relative to history. Now that doesn't preclude investing in equities. And certainly when you look at international stocks, developed international emerging market equities, these are sectors that have more attractive valuations and should be part of your diversified portfolio. But again, this also argues for slower or lower 
returns going forward. And again, the key here is the earnings yield. What we've done here is subtract the earnings yield, earnings divided by the price of the index for equities and just subtract the 10 year treasury yield. Those earnings continue to grow for equities that'll support valuations as I mentioned previously, so something to watch. But again, the takeaway here, valuations expensive, expect lower returns. Again, wouldn't abandon an equity investment, a long-term plan. It just pays to stay invested over the longer term. And on a broader perspective, important to note that after a bear market, you tend to have additional gains in the second year. So the bear market uh, began in March 20, or actually hit the bottom in March 23, 2020. We are now past the one year mark. So what happens in year two? And we talked a little bit about this in our Outlook video. Year two also sees gains. In fact, if you go back to 1957, anytime the S&P 500 has declined over 20%, a typical bear market, you've seen a strong bounce back in the first year. More importantly, you've seen gains in the second year as well. And on the far right, you can see that average gain record represented by the dark blue bar of almost 13%, 12.7% to be exact. So typically gains have continued in year two. Obviously this has been a very strong bounce back accompanied by a lot of stimulus as well. There is probably more upside. I think it's certainly more muted as I mentioned, but the other thing to keep in mind is look at the yellow bars. There is a correction in all of those second years on average, almost 10%. So although volatility really has not been around much in 2021, uh, a brief correction in the uh, NASDAQ uh, in February of this year, but for the most part, have not seen that correction. So the market's been relatively resilient, but do not be surprised by a correction. The other item I'd note is the market is very broad. Over 90% of S&P 500 stocks, well above their 200-day moving average. It's a good healthy indicator that does not preclude a near-term correction, but over the longer term, that's been a good time there are rarely seen, I should I say, a, a, uh, you've not seen a new bear market start off of that type of condition. So fundamentals healthy, technical indicators still favorable for equities and cash is punitive. So we would still remain fully invested uh, and focused on equities. Let me shift to another topic here. In, uh, inflation certainly been a hot topic in the markets. Uh, certainly March died down a little bit. This is a Google search trend for the word inflation. You can see how it has spiked higher in 2021. This has been the risk cited in the media and by many, given the amount of stimulus, given the expected bounce back in the economy as vaccines enable us to go back to our normal lives. Inflation will pick up and keep in mind that March April and May are going to see some notable increases in inflation. In fact, we just had the March CPI or Consumer Price Index report. It was stronger than expected. Overall inflation rising to 2.5%. Don't be surprised if that gets to 4% by May. That's largely due to a favorable year-over-year -year or depressed condition last year at the start of the pandemic when prices were down. And now as the economy reopens, it creates a favorable year-over-year -year comparison. Uh, beyond May, it's somewhat questionable how long these uh, inflation, high inflation will persist. We still have some supply bottlenecks due to COVID, but for the most part, we, I think there's a lot of question marks on whether inflation sticks around. So be prepared for a short-term rise. I don't think it sticks around longer term, uh, but that is something on the minds of investors. I certainly wouldn't let it preclude you from investing. And an important message from the bond market, if you look at treasury inflation, protected securities, you can back out what the implied inflation rate is on those securities. And you can see, as you look at a two-year maturity, uh, that inflation rate's relatively high, almost 2.7%, but you can see how it comes down sharply as you look at five and 10-year expectations. In fact, pretty benign view from the bond market here, even up to 10 years. Basically, the bond market remains unconvinced that inflation will persist beyond the near term. This could change depending on how events warrant. If it does, you might see more pressure on bond yields. Uh, but for the most part, the bond market is telling you that yes, this is likely to be a short-term phenomenon. Two of the biggest factors supporting low inflation, uh, technology and an aging population globally. And those two trends won't be changing uh, in the near term. So keep that in mind on inflation. Important to note that that rising bond yields, even if they are in response to higher inflation, typically don't pose a problem for the stock market. Went back over the last 20 years and came up with all the major or most substantial sell-offs in the bond market. 
You can see that represented by the change in the 10-year treasury yield in the middle portion of this chart. Uh, you can see that the change in the 10-year treasury yield, which many times was significant, in fact, on average at the bottom there, up 1.17%, or that's the total change. That's a fairly hefty move to see a full percentage point or more move in the 10-year treasury yield uh, during a sell-off. Uh, in the current episode, which started August 4th, I have an asterisk there for March 31st. We don't know necessarily if it's over, but the peak was 1.74. There have been about four weeks of stability in the bond market, but still a hefty move higher 1.2% by 1.2 percentage points on the 10-year treasury yield. Still, the S&P 500 uh, measure of the U.S. stock market has increased over 20%. And if you look back at all these periods, the average gain for the equity market has been almost 10%. So rising bond yields, typically a reflection of a stronger economy, which is generally good for stocks. And that's why you've seen positive returns over periods of rising rates in the past. Now let's move to talk about bonds. It was a difficult quarter for the bond market down over 3%, one of the worst quarterly performances on record. I went back and looked at all the times the bond markets declined 2% or more for a, for a single quarter. And you can see that the average decline was 3.8%. And you can also see that the 12-month return after that uh, was relatively positive. In fact, you had 11% gain. A lot of that is simply due to the fact, uh, sort of skewed by those returns in the 80s when interest rates were much higher. Uh, all but one of those were positive. I'd focus more on the, the 90s and forward, and you can see mid-single digit returns for the bond market. Given the level of yields today, I wouldn't expect quite that return, but it tells you one thing, and that typically bond weakness when it's, when it's extreme, like it was in the first quarter, and again, it's nothing like stock declines, tends to plateau. And so we do expect slightly higher yields, but we do think the bulk of the move in the bond market is behind us. And again, we'll see how that plays out. But for those, we still think bonds play a key diversification role. Our expectation for bonds over the next three to five years is about a one and a half to two and a half percent total return environment, some years better, some years lower. We wouldn't, uh, again, abandon bonds and think the worst might be behind us. In terms of trying to handicap what that might mean, here's the 10-year treasury yield. And with the red arrows showed all the other times that the 10-year treasury yield has increased over a period of time. The ones in the uh, two periods where the change in the 10-year treasury yield was over two percentage points in early 1993 and again in the late 90s. Those were fueled by uh, big or significant rate hike campaigns by the Federal Reserve, where they went out and looked to raise rates fairly steadily. The other, On average, this has been a 1.7% increase in the 10-year treasury yield. As mentioned on the prior chart, the 10-year treasury yield is up 1.2%. Uh, by 1.2% since the low. So if it does keep in line with that history, it's another half a percent uh, that is not catastrophic. A low 2% yield on the 10-year treasury yield is not an impediment to the equity market. And again, if that happens gradually, we still think that you could have positive longer-term returns in the bond market. We think it's a much slower pace of a rate rise from here. And a muni market, certainly more resilient. If we do get tax increases along with this infrastructure build, uh, bill, we should see more resilient performance from the municipal market, similar to what we saw maybe to the same magnitude as the first quarter. So stay with uh, intermediate bonds. The real interest rate risk is more in the 10 to 30 year range. Those intermediate bonds are good, again, diversifier to an equity portfolio. So that's all I have for today. Thanks very much for listening, taking time out of your day. If you need more info or details, please reach out to your relationship manager. And we'll speak to you again next quarter. Thank you.